anticoagulants. I was thinking about this uh, this presentation, and those of you who have seen my office know that it's wall-to-wall -wall books. And uh, my I, I have an ICU pharmacology book that dates back to the 90s. And the anticoagulation chapter really was current until last year. I mean, for about 60 years, it's been heparin and warfarin, or heparin and coumadin, whatever you care to call it. I mean, that was the strategy for anticoagulation. Now I'm afraid those of us who see patients acutely could, uh, you know, could run into uh, medications that, uh, that, some, that are difficult to remember and sometimes difficult to pronounce. So we're going to talk about what we know about reversing these agents. Those of you who went to the trauma conference, um, this is adapted from a talk that Dr. Morton gave in the first session. I've expanded it because Dr. Morton, um, Dr. Lisa Kreisiger, and I are submitting a paper to the Journal of Trauma reviewing this <coughs> subject. So I've expanded those comments um, and modified the talk somewhat, um, adding a bit, of, uh, a bit of information to that. So if this is uh, at times redundant, I ask those of you who heard Dr. Morton to, uh, to be patient with me. So these are the agents that we're going to talk about. Um, and in addition to talking about the new, some of the new anticoagulants, we're going to talk about what we know about some of the new agents to reverse them. Because at the same time that a number of new agents have come on the market, um, we're also seeing an explosion in products that may have a role in reversing them. But unfortunately, the match between agent and reversal is nowhere near as clean as it was for heparin and Coumadin, as, uh, as I'm afraid you'll see, which only complicates the decisions we're going to have to make acutely in the emergency department or the ICU setting. Now, you'll see this diagram a couple of times. Um, it's the classic intrinsic and extrinsic pathway coagulation cascade. I'm not going to spend a lot of time focusing on it, and I'm not recommending that anyone memorize it. It's in, uh, it's in every book um, that has this subject included. Um, the, the factors that I would ask you just to file away in the back of your minds, 2, 10, 7, and 9. What are they? This is the audience participation part. <laughs> the vitamin K dependent factors. Yes. Thank you. The other thing, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, um, but we're, and I, I'm just putting up all the arrows because this is not the focus of what we're talking about. We've also learned that there's back feedback, if you will, back control, um, where clot is being formed on the activity of factors. And we've learned that the platelet is not uh, feedback control, if you will. And we learned that the platelet is not just a passive plug. It's actually a site where we can independently act on the coagulation cascade. So there's been an awful lot learned about the biology of what we were probably all taught as a very straightforward string of reactions. Now we know that there's a lot more going on there and a lot more crosstalk than we originally might have thought. So what is Coumadin? What does it do? Well, we already heard. It affects the production or the maintenance of the 2, 7, 9, and 10, the K-dependent factors. It does that by affecting the activity of two enzymes, um, quinone and epoxide reductase. Um, vitamin K circles through, um, and in the course of doing that, um, maintains the levels of these, uh, of these factors. Now, this brings to mind another, another question. What amount of these factors do you need to have for effective anticoagulation? <coughs> How much, how much of a, you know, of a typical factor do you need to have adequate hemostasis? Yeah. 100%, 80%, 60%, 20%? Dr. Leroy, you look like you're ready to venture a, <laughs> venture a guess. Uh, my colleague thinks it's 30. Your colleague is right. 
20 to 30 percent. So I, I just, again, I'm going to throw some things out to put what I'm saying in context because you're rapidly going to see how little data we have in this area. But in general, we can see hemostasis with as little as 20 to 30 percent of normal levels of these factors. So when we're replacing, that's probably clinically what we're replacing to. But we're happy because the patient stops bleeding or the bleeding slows down. Uh oh. How did I get to hyperspace? I wasn't I wasn't doing anything. Three minute mark. Ah, there we go. Was that was that it? Talking too long? <laughs> All right. Okay. What are the what are the guidelines? What would you be asked on an exam about uh, Coumadin reversal? Obviously, hold the drug, vitamin K, IV. As a matter of fact, the American College of Chest Physician every couple of years publishes a you know a volume of several hundred pages on management of coagulation um, and the latest data on venous thromboembolic disorders in <clears throat> critically ill patients. That's probably the, the international standard right now. Um, obviously, the heme societies um, put out their own documents, but the ACCP, you know, historically has been the organization that's sort of summarized that data and collected it and produced guidelines for clinicians. So, hold Coumadin, vitamin K, IV, plasma, we'll talk about the dosing, and then consider prothrombin complex concentrates, which we're going to talk about a lot. Um, and oh, that factor 7a may have uh, may have a role here as well. Let's talk about administration of vitamin K first of all. Um, best to give it IV. Sub Q absorption is unreliable. There is a risk of anaphylaxis, so it's probably a slow IV push, but certainly could be done in the emergency department. But don't give someone vitamin K and send them to a test or send them upstairs. Um, you know, watch them for a few minutes. So I would, I would say for the emergency medicine people here, keep them in the department just so that uh, just so that you can keep an eye on them, and you can expect um, some activity with vitamin K with uh, within an hour or two. So vitamin K clearly um, one of the key tools in uh, you know in Coumadin reversal. Well, what about uh, what about the role of plasma? I mean, we always think of plasma. That's the first thing we think about. Remember, our clinical target, um, we're going to be happy when we see 20 to 30 percent of clotting factors replaced. Um, what's the dose? I mean, we never, I never can remember what the dose is. Um, but with our standard plasma, you're probably looking at 15 to 20 milliliters per kilogram. Now, you have to guesstimate that because obviously the amount of plasma that you get in a bag um, you know, varies probably based on donor characteristics. Um, contains all the clotting factors. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of factor seven and factor five that are, uh, you know, that are either lost or not, uh, not effectively stored. <coughs> Thus, to jump ahead a little bit, the potential role for recombinant factor seven A um, to complement, if you will, the clotting factors that are provided in plasma. Well, what are the problems? Large amount of fluid, because let's face it, your patients on warfarin typically have some form of cardiovascular disease, um, and they don't tolerate large amounts of fluid frequently. Um, plasma can be associated with a variety of allergic reactions or in the, uh, or in the ICU um, transfusion-related um, reactions. And the depending, again, on the degree of anticoagulation present, your INR can start going back up in just uh, in just a few hours, factor 7A again, which could complement the plasma, has actually been around since 1999. Obviously, has seen the most activity as an off-label product used by the military. Although the military is now shying away from factor 7A, because if I can summarize a large amount of trauma literature and grossly overgeneralize, it probably decreases the amount of blood products that you use but we haven't been able to effectively demonstrate that it's changed outcome. Um, what was it actually developed for? Um, hemophilias or patients with specific factor seven deficiencies. Um, there is a variety of dosing um, and typically you determine what the dosing is by deciding whether you're controlling bleeding. 
the half-life is relatively short. So patients who are getting a, you know, who have a problem that can be treated with this agent may wind up getting serial doses unless you've gotten good hemostasis um, during the time of the first dose being <coughs> effective. Um, factor seven, um, we've learned, works through the traditional coagulation cascade, but also has, I'm sorry, this is the coagulation cascade. This is to remind us that you also have a platelet defect, you know, a platelet dependent mechanism. So again, platelet is not just a passive um, participant, if you will. It doesn't just, it's not just a plug waiting to land somewhere. It's actually an active cycle <coughs> coagulation that can occur. And these agents can work either through the traditional cascade or at the level of the platelet. And again, thus the relevance of factor seven in Coumadin reversal, but also it's being considered as part of protocols for any platelet agents. <coughs> okay, so what's some of the data on factor seven for Coumadin reversals? Here's a study where a large number of doses, a huge range of doses was given in healthy volunteers. Any one of those doses normalized the INR. These are patients with an INR greater than two. If you used a smaller dose, the duration of activity is shorter. If you used a larger dose, the duration of INR reduction um, is longer. Not, uh, not terribly surprising. Um, <coughs> In a randomized placebo-controlled trial of healthy volunteers, um, again, factor 7A reversed a lot of the laboratory effects of Coumadin, but interestingly enough, when you looked at bottom line bleeding, um, if you did a standard punch test in the skin and looked at the duration of bleeding, there didn't seem to be a consistent effect there. What's the argument? It's more than factor seven that's, uh, that's needed. Factor seven could be part of the puzzle, but factor seven isn't, uh, isn't the only answer. Here's another trial, small number of patients, relatively low dose of factor seven, given in conjunction with vitamin K and a smaller amount of plasma, dramatic reduction in INR, rapid response, and of the 16 patients studied, 14 had an excellent response. So what's the takeaway message? It's probably not any one of these agents by itself, um, but in conjunction, um, the factor seven, if you administer it, it will take over, if you will, or supply the factor seven that's deficient in plasma. Vitamin K, longer term, you know, longer duration of action, but shorter onset of action um, will help address the K-dependent factors probably there's some role for all of these agents in a reasonable protocol for rapid and effective Coumadin reversal. This is similar to a lot of the other trauma literature. This is factor 7A for reversal of warfarin in patients with head injury and intracranial hemorrhage. Um, to summarize a lot of text on the slide, um, probably you can decrease blood product use. Survival is not, uh, is not different. And there is a risk of hypercoagulable um, response in some at-risk vascular beds. Um, the two that we worry about the most are the coronary vascular bed um, and also the, the CNS. So you can very quickly bring the INR down um, and you can decrease the amount of plasma that's required. But with all of these agents, there are, uh, there are trade-offs. So pros and cons, factor 7A low volume, very fast onset, um, minimal systemic activation of coagulation, but you can have thrombus in your CNS and in your coronary circulation. This isn't cheap. We don't have easy laboratory monitoring. We don't have a lot of good trials at this point. Probably the best clinical trial was, what was that, 16 patients? Not a, not a world of data on something that's, uh, you know, that's going to give your, your pharmacist heartburn if we use, uh, if we use a lot of it. Um, and you remember the study I talked about early in these remarks where they, they went from like one to over a hundred, you know, micrograms of this material. I mean, there is no standard of, of dosing whatsoever. And uh, this is a comment from Dr. Morton. She says, unfortunately, 
Um, she's not aware of more trials in the, in the pipeline right now. And let's face it, in this day and age, those, uh, those trials are, are very expensive and difficult to run. Hard to standardize patients, hard to make, hard to get comparable, uh, comparable groups. So let's talk about another new procoagulant material that's coming on the market, the pros and cons of it. I don't know, I want to spend a lot of time talking about affini affinity chromatography, but very briefly, I thought that this is, a, this is a brilliant application. Basically, what they're doing is taking monoclonal antibodies and choosing the factors that they want the antibodies to bind to. Then they run the plasma through a column which picks out the factors that they want based on what the antibodies have, you know, have adhered to. And they take pooled plasma and then pull factors out of large amounts of plasma. I, when I saw this, I thought, that, geez, that's, that's ingenious. So they basically customized um, you know, a, fact, a, a clotting factor package. And remember, if Coumadin is your principal anticoagulant, you ought to be able to customize a clotting factor package to address deficits in K-dependent clotting factors. And they've done that with the four K-dependent clotting factors, as well as protein C and protein S. Originally, these PCCs were developed to treat factor IX deficiency um, and used for hemophilias. Um, but of course, if you've got something that looks like it has promise in this area, uh, the emergency department and acute surgical people are going to want to rapidly uh, evaluate it in other areas as well. Again. You get small volume of material. It contains varying amounts of all the vitamin K dependent factors. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. We've got a, got a nice table. Um, again, you can have a thrombotic response, both venous and arterial. Um, you can induce a hypercoagulable state. So patients have to be watched for that as well. <coughs> I am, I'm not aware of reports for blood-borne diseases, but if you think that we're now using large amounts of pooled plasma, so you're, you're talking about exposure to many donors in forming one of these PCC units, um, there's at least a theoretical concern about blood-borne diseases, and as these are used more widely, we may learn more about the degree of risk that's present. There's variable concentrations. Um, in the United States, um, there are three of the four K-dependent factor um, PCCs on the market. So here's, here's a table, again, my only reason putting all this data together is to show you that when we talk about a PCC, we're not talking, you know, they're, they're, they're not, uh, there's apples and oranges here. Uh, some of them, for example, contain no factor seven. Um, and the amount of the various factors, I mean, just don't worry about the details. Just look at the look at the table. And you can see that depending on what PCC you have in your hospital or is available in your emergency room, you're going to get a different number of factors. Some have three, some have four of the K-dependent factors. Um, and I'm going to have to assume that the amount of a PCC that you're going to need, um, the dosing is, is going to be different depending on what the product is that you have. And I'll, and I'll jump ahead a little bit because this, this table led me to communicate with Dr. Bauman Kreuziger and Dr. Morton. I said, when we were writing the paper, we're not putting doses for these agents in. And Dr. Morton said, it's because nobody knows. Um, the bottom line, and I'll repeat this later, is if we choose to use a lot of the agents that I'm talking about, it's going to be our clinical assessment. Whether, the, whether we're getting the you know, inadequate hemostatic effect and then making a decision, do we use more of the same material or do we use, um, or do we use a complementary material? The one thing I will point out very quickly about the PCCs um, that are available in the United States is that all of them um, basically are, you know, they're, they're pr principally three-factor PCCs. They have little or no factor seven. So if you're going to think about using a PCC in the management of someone with a coagulation deficit that you need to address quickly, if you think PCC, think, gee, do I need to give a dose of factor seven A along with it 
because I've got a big hole in coverage with factor seven, which is also the trigger for one of those arms of that coagulation cascade that we looked at before. Well, what's some of the data with these, uh, with these PCCs? Well, here's a study where patients got lower high dose, three factor PCCs, um, but they gave vitamin K, all right? So that's gonna in part cover the factor seven deficiency, low dose or high dose. If you just give 25 units per kilogram of the low, you know, or the low dose of the PCC, the INR goes from nine to less than three, in 55% of patients add plasma, you're much more effective. Larger dose, again, you're more likely to reduce the, uh, well, you re again, you reduce the INR, but adding plasma again, because again, you've got the gap in three-factor PCCs, um, add plasma will at least give you some of that factor seven, and the amount of plasma that you need, much, much less. So, they don't adequately reduce the INR with the three-factor PCCs that are available in this country, um, but with just a small amount of plasma <coughs> or consider factor 7A to specifically address that defect, um, you, can, uh, you can more rapidly uh, decrease the, the INR. <coughs> so they're more effective. We don't know what the appropriate dose is. We probably should use PCCs in conjunction with plasma. Four-factor PCCs, which include the factor seven, um, may be better than three-factor PCCs with factor seven A or, or three-factor PCCs with plasma. That's in theory. We don't have data. And again, it's gonna depend what three-factor PCC are you using, what four-factor PCCs are you using. I'm not gonna go back to that table but they differ in the amount of factor seven that they, that they have as well. And if, we, if we're still shooting in the dark, just about you know, the broad concepts of the biology, there's no outcome data or, you know, or mortality data available. But now at least we're getting a feel for the biology of the, the products that are, uh, that are available. So what's our, what is our protocol right now? Um, INR is greater than 1.4. Consider factor 7A, it's a weight-based dose. Remember, you can see efficacy with factor 7A with very small doses. Definitely give vitamin K and give the plasma dosing that we talked about. Now, what if you're not gonna tolerate that amount of plasma? <coughs> Do you substitute a PCC um, to go along with uh, the factor 7A? Don't know. I mean, it's, it's something uh, it's something to think about, and uh, you know, and we'll learn uh, we'll learn more we'll learn more as we go on. Certainly, PCCs and factor 7A are better than than just a plasma load. Um, PCCs replace more of the K dependent factors, <coughs> but they do have they do have a thrombotic risk, and we talked about at risk beds. Um, we don't know optimal dosing for any of these materials. And if we had a four-factor PCC, in other words, a PCC designed for all of the K-dependent factors, can we just get rid of factors 7A and plasma altogether? Theoretically, but um, we're, uh, we're still in the development phase with, uh, with a lot of these materials. Okay, let's go back to uh, anticoagulant agents. Um, this is on TV. Um, this is in... Um, you know, virtually any of our publications that might be seen by practitioners treating cardiovascular disease. Um, Dabigatran or Pradaxa is a direct um, thrombin or factor two inhibitor. Um, I'm not gonna, I can read all this to you, but you can read it faster than I can. It is approved for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Um, it is being looked at um, in other settings as prophylaxis around orthopedic surgery. Um, because it's very convenient. It's, it's oral, you don't have to monitor it, you don't have to titrate it, um, except based on renal function. That's the key factor, is what's the patient's renal function. The dosing changes um, if the patient's renal function is compromised. But for the most part, um, you know, very simple to dose. Your risk of CNS bleeds 
at least in the data that's available right now, is less. Um, and But your risk of GI bleeds is somewhat higher. So certainly no worse than Coumadin. Um, and just parenthetically, if the, the Coumadin data looks worse than some of these agents, probably the disadvantage that patients on Coumadin have is that their INR is doing a sine wave. We frequently don't pick that up because we don't check their INRs daily once people are on chronic therapy. The advantage of some of these oral agents, which I'm going to talk about now, is that they don't, uh, you know, they don't need that monitoring and, at least in theory, are giving a much more consistent anticoagulation effect. And like I say, this is, uh, this is already FDA approved and uh, people are starting to come to ERs around town um, with it. Now, dabigatran affects a number of the clotting parameters that we can measure, but not in a consistent fashion. For example, the APTT does not respond in a linear fashion, so you can't use a PTT to see what your dabigatran effect is. It just plateaus at high levels, uh, at high levels of the drug. Um, INR may or may not be affected. Um, there is a linear response if you're measuring the thrombin time, but if you look, this is just a large scatter plot of where the thrombin time versus the co plasma concentration of dabigatran is, there's still a fairly wide range. And the other thing that Dr. Morton likes to point out is you have to make sure that your assays are calibrated to get, a, to get consistent measurement. I mean, what we measure might be different than what St. Joe's measures, than what the university measures. Again, depending on the reagents used and the way the assay is, is calibrated. So unlike assays we've had up to now, um, we don't have a consistent measure um, for activity of dabigatran. Thrombin time and Ekron clotting time, don't ask me what that is. Um, I've never used it, but if you talk to a hematologist, they'll say, yes, you can, you can measure that. But right now, we don't have a consistent way to measure effect. This is on the market. I, I've talked with some of the cardiologists. They love it. You can give it orally. It works quickly. It doesn't need to be monitored. And it's got relatively few of the, of the, uh, of the interactions. Our, I know our EP group, uh, they like to prescribe it. Um, problems? We don't know how to monitor it effectively. Um, assays for drug concentra concentration aren't available. Um, you could be seeing a consumptive coagulopathy, or you could be seeing dilution and blame it on uh, and blame it on dabigatran in a patient who's got who has been on dabigatran in the setting of complex critical illness. There is no antidote for this uh, for this material, um, and if your patient is so, you're basically waiting for renal clearance, and if your patient's in renal failure, um, you're going to prolong the the half life. Plasma is not going to reverse the anticoagulant effects. We'll look at the, 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 the drawing again, but basically you can load um, you know, people with you know, clotting factors proximal on the cascade, but factor two is far enough down that you can load as much as you want proximally. You're not going to affect the downstream effect, which is clotting, because factor two is at the junction, if you will, of the two pathways. The comet is the part of the common arm and if you've blocked everything in factor two, you're not going to fix it with plasma. If the patient has taken a dose of drug within two hours, give them activated charcoal. Otherwise, you need to, uh, you need to dialyze them. What about factor 7A and PCCs? There's some data in some settings that these may be helpful. Um, a lot of this right now is being done in basic science laboratories. But there's, like I say, there's no great antidote despite, um, you know, the custom agents which are now available. Now maybe we can use the chromatography technology and build something to, you know, to address the Vega trend. Right now, uh, right now there is there is nothing. So, for the folks in the emergency department or the ICU, activated charcoal if they've just taken the drug, you'll have to dialyze it otherwise. And the rest of it is just supportive transfusion therapy. Um, starting with PAC cells, if it looks like you're going to give a lot of blood products, then Dr. Morton would recommend doing the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one 
so that you're not looking at a disproportionate administration of blood components and seeing a you know a component of additional coagulopathy on that uh, on that basis and we talk about uh, you know, consider factor 7a but you know there's 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 theoretical benefit but we don't have uh, we don't have uh, strong data and this is actually um, the ICSI guideline and again um, I, I didn't really contribute to it but I was able to sit in with a number of institutions around the state on the conversations that led to this being developed again um, Dr. Morton really uh, receives, uh, receives the kudos um, for at least putting out an approach to patients receiving this, uh, this medication um, in an emergency basis. Well, that's, uh, that's not the end of it. Um, we've got factor 10A inhibitors um, in the pipeline. I have not heard of any patients that we've had to manage with acute bleeding with rivaroxaban, but rivaroxaban is FDA approved for similar indications um, to dabigatran. Um, Apixaban will probably be approved very soon, um, and there is more um, that are in the pipeline. Now, the interesting thing is that Batixaban is being developed with, uh, with an antidote. So someone in, uh, in Big Pharma is, uh, is listening. So a little bit more on Rivaroxaban. Um, another oral agent, very convenient to, to give. Um, again, highly dependent on, on renal function. Um, probably the best way to monitor this is an anti-10A assay. The good news is that we do anti-10A assays um, to evaluate patients on low molecular weight heparins. So we have some of that technology um, in-house. Um, again, no antidote. If the patient has taken a dose within two to three hours, give them activated charcoal. Unlike dabigatran, which is not, which is not, I'm sorry, which is not tightly protein bound, this material is tightly protein bound, so you can't pyolyze it away. Um, there may be some benefit with PCCs, but those are volunteer studies, probably in medical students. I hope I'm not offending any medical students in the room, but they tend to be, uh, they tend to be uh, featured in some of those trials. So. Uh, another summary of the, the new oral anticoagulants, um, the factor two inhibitor, dabigatran. Um, the rest of the, the new oral anticoagulants in the pipeline are factor 10A inhibitors. Um, you can see some of their pharmacologic um, properties. Um, the difference between dabigatran and the other two agents, um, this is dialyzable. These two are not because they're highly, highly protein bound. Um, we can monitor activity with an anti-10A assay in the 10, in, in the factor 10 inhibitors. Um, we'll probably have to, if we see a lot of patients with the bigotran, figure out how to modify our thrombin time assay so that we can evaluate patients to bigotran activity. Now, We've spent a lot of time talking about some of the agents that are on this slide. Um, the antifibrinolytic agents is another conversation in itself. Um, you know, quite quite remarkable. Um, the only thing, again, I would remind us all of is that when we say we're going to use a PCC, you really have to know the characteristics of the of the PCC um, to make decisions about what you may or may not have to give with it. Um, because of the varying number and type of clotting factors that they include. So this is sort of a hand-drawn table from the paper, again, showing where the, these various agents um, are active. The prothrombin complex concentrates, there could also be a dotted line to factor seven. So these are tailor-made to address Coumadin anticoagulation. Um, apixaban and rivaroxaban um, are going to be 10A inhibitors. You can see the bigotran though sits at the junction of the two cascades, much harder to treat if you're just loading upstream clotting factors. So this is sort of a consensus summary of patients receiving any of these agents. Um, we talked about the fact that we, we have varying ways to monitor their efficacy. 
we want to see what their liver and renal function is like in any of these agents because if they have renal function compromise, we know that the duration of, of activity is going to be prolonged. Um, and then we look for things that we can address to, uh, to control bleeding, whether it's embolization, whether it's surgical procedures, recognizing that we don't have a quick fix um, you know, in, terms of, in terms of clotting in patients, uh, in patients on, these, uh, on these agents. Okay, a couple comments on, on antiplatelet agents very quickly. Aspirin, the, the classic antiplatelet agent, cyclooxygenase inhibitor, um, the others, um, Plavix, adenosine diphosphate inhibitors, um, standard times to stop these agents um, prior to operation. But what about the patient um, you know, who comes in receiving them? Well, here's a trial. Volunteers, again, receiving aspirin and Plavix. Um, you normalize platelet function. Again, that doesn't mean you have normal numbers of functioning platelets, but you're getting hemostasis with roughly two phoresis units of platelets as they're delivered in this building. Those of you who all of us work in other hospitals, you know, the answer to this question, what you have to give, um, you know, may be, uh, may be different depending on the way platelets are delivered in your blood bank. Um, consider DVA, DDAVP if patients won't tolerate that plasma. And remember that factor 7A also has platelet-based effects and may be used in conjunction um, with some of the other, maybe used in conjunction with platelets, maybe a reduced dose of platelets in, uh, you know, in patients who have gotten um, aspirin, Plavix, or some combination of those or, or similar agents. But again, we need a little more, uh, a little more data. How do you verify that you're accomplishing what, uh, what, you, what, you want to, what you want to see? Well, a lot of our standard platelet function testing is, is suboptimal. There is now a clopidogrel or Plavix specific uh, function assay, which uh, has been used in optimizing dosing in cardiac patients, but obviously it can help us assess what's going on in the patient who is acutely ill as well. Um, but we don't know yet um, whether this is actually going to be clinical ap clinically applicable in an emergency department or an ICU setting. The bottom line in many of these, now we're knowing a little bit more of the biology, but knowing the variability in the agents, your, your decision is still, uh, is still a, a clinical one. But I think there's going to be much more conversation about uh, about these agents, um, you know, in the you know in the coming months and years, because I think now that big pharma has uh, has recognized that they can produce them, and let's face it, if you if you tell a patient that uh, they don't have to get poked, um, or they don't have to get their they don't have to get their INR drawn every week, they, they can just take a little pill once or twice a day, that's that's going to be very popular. So we're we're going to have to figure out uh, figure out what to do about it. So, questions? <clears throat> yes, please. Is PCC available here? I believe we do. Um, but because actually we were approached to be involved in some of the PCC trials. I'm not absolutely certain, but uh, I know I haven't used one, but I know Dr. Morton is, uh, you know, has been very involved with people who are developing those, uh, those materials. So if anyone would know that they're whether they are available here, she would. So it's something we could consider now if we run Well, I you know, I'm I called the pharmacy in November and they said no. Yeah, okay. The pharmacy's telling us no, at least at this point. But okay. maybe if you went through him. Well, I that, yeah, that I that suspect that the answer that's true. And I think the answer that Colleen Morton gets might be different than the answer that we get. And in fairness, I don't know prices on these materials but they can't be cheap, given the technologies we're talking about in, uh, in developing. All right, I, there's, a, there's a few eyes open yet, and uh, Dr. Hawthorne and I have a couple of cases um, to talk about as, uh, as a bonus. Let's, uh, I'm gonna do the second case first, Clint, while you bring up the images on the first one. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, I was called to see a 69-year-old woman yesterday 
Uh, those of you who know this patient, please um, let, let the others have the fun. Um, she was near Osceola, was eating her toast for breakfast, healthy woman. She has a history of hypertension for which she takes a beta blocker and her, uh, and her personal physician has her on aspirin. That's basically it. Um, was eating toast, started choking on her toast at home and developed severe chest pain um, radiating you know, through to her back. She went to the Osceola ER and was ruled out for myocardial infarction and she was, uh, she was sent to us. CT scan at that time showed nonspecific thickening of the esophagus and, um, and food in the esophagus. So she was sent from their ER to our ER is my understanding. I don't know, did anyone see her here? Okay, how, how did she look when, when she was here? I, I took her first. Yeah. She was miserable. I thought she was, I still thought she was having her mind based on the story we had gotten. If we had just gotten maybe a little dilated this kind of face, but she just looked miserable. And we didn't get the report with the food, uh, food in it either. Even when I called our radiologist here, we looked at it, he didn't really know. He said there was something going on with her. Okay. All right, and uh, the imaging is from outside, and we don't uh, and we don't have it. So I guess you you worked her up though, and at least it didn't appear she was having acute MI. And the CT scan ruled out a dissection, which I think would be the two things that that I would I would worry about at least. So she was sent up to she was sent up to endoscopy, um, and they. And they, I happened to be around and had been in the GI lab earlier in the afternoon, and I got a 911 page to to go back to the uh, to the GI lab, um, and basically they showed me images the entire back of the posterior two thirds of her esophagus was black, and the. Um, yeah, this would have been a good good image for you, Dr. Kilgore. I see Dr. Dr. Kilgore opened his eyes at uh, at that one. Um, now the patient is uh, you know she's a little sleepy, but her vital signs are stable. She's afebrile. There's no subcutaneous air. I mean the X-rays don't show any mediastinal gas. So now we need a surgical resident. Where are they, Dr. Gertner? I, I saw her too. Did you? Yeah. Okay. So I I, maybe I shouldn't ask. I shouldn't ask you because you already know the know the punchline. Did Dr. Holly see her with you, or did Dr. Stevens see her with you? What do you think, Dan? Was the toast that she ate burned? Oh, she's good at making her toast. Her husband <laughs> lovingly <laughs> makes it for her each morning. <laughs> um, I guess I would be concerned for some necrosis. Esophagus from the pressure of the food bowls in her esophagus for a long period of time. Okay, so what should we what should we do with her? So if she had a negative uh, CT scan, I guess uh, the next test would be a contrast study. Okay, uh, we could we could do that. We we ultimately didn't uh, we ultimately didn't do that, um, and I because I want to talk about the other case and give people a chance to stretch. Wolf, you want to give us the the punchline? Well, it appeared that this hard piece of toast dissected her submucosa and created a large amount of bleeding throughout the kind of the venous plexus of the submucosa and dissected distally down to the G junction almost. So it caused basically a contained hemorrhage of the submucosa of the esophagus. Which, and actually, we, <coughs> we started to figure that out when GI decided they were going to do a little biopsy and <laughs> they got Sorry. some, they got some bleeding. For their for their trouble, because remember she's on aspirin. So we just we just talked about uh, we just talked about that she is likely to, to bleed, and it turns out that uh, spontaneous dissection, if you will, of the you know, laminar dissection of you know the layers of the esophagus has been reported. Um, the management is expectant, but she was put in the SICU overnight. Um, I think I don't know. Did she? I don't think she had any problems last night, other than. Other than some some pain, and she'll have follow up endoscopy, and uh, and probably some some surgical follow up. But uh, I certainly had never seen something like that before. 
but it's the picture didn't fit with full thickness esophageal necrosis because she's she's laying there sleeping with stable vital signs, normal heart rate, and yet very impressive endoscopic findings. Um, so we said she must have dissected along the 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 area the involved area of the esophagus and uh, you know and then GI inadvertently decompressed her when they when they took uh, when they took a biopsy to see what uh, to see what was uh, what was going on so she went from someone who might need an emergency esophagectomy to uh, you know to someone who uh, is probably just going to be observed for a couple of days and uh, then sent home for outpatient follow up Oh, and did we reverse her aspirin effects? Yeah, we transfused her to a free system treatments. Yeah, I mean, I, again, given what we just talked about and what she was doing and her process, um, you know, I, I, I talked, I, I mean, I called me, so I talked, to, <coughs> I, I talked with Clint and we just said, you know, given this, I think she, she wasn't on aspirin because she was at significant risk for you know, any cardiovascular event. Um, everybody gets aspirin these days, at least when you reach my age. So, all right, let's talk about uh, the other case. But that, that may be something that some of you haven't seen before. So just, just file that one away in the back of your, in the back of your minds in the dif that differential diagnosis of someone who gets that horrible tearing chest pain and then you, don't, and then you scan them and the aorta looks okay and their MI workup is is unremarkable. They could have. Uh, they, it could be an esophageal issue. Okay. All right. So this is a patient that Dr. Leroy saw. So if I get anything wrong, you can let me know. It's a gentleman who came in on the 27th of December. He's 76. Uh, he's an outdoor kind of guy, and he was out on his ice boat. I guess this is a boat that has ice skates on it and a sail on it, and you take it across the the ice. And it, it, either the front ice skate went through the ice or he had open water, one of the two, and it came to an abrupt stop. Uh, doesn't think that he hit his head. He had a helmet on. Um, after the accident, he took down his boat and he walked a half mile back to his house where he had a presinkable sensation. And it's at that point that he called 911 and he arrives to the emergency department on a backboard and collared conversant with stable vital signs, complaining of uh, mainly of uh, belly pain and some back pain, but the back pain is kind of chronic and then he complains of um, bilateral hamstring pain, which that was interesting. So. The only other thing I would add from that from that note, which I thought was very interesting, is that this stop was sufficient to snap his ice boat in half. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that's that's pretty that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So, Dr. Leroy, I guess you I, we now know that you were the uh, initial treating practitioner. Yeah. What do you think, and what did you do? Since you know what it showed, we don't. Uh, we'll let Dr. Ellingson uh, interpret it for us from the back <coughs> of the room. So this is you start in the uh, right upper quadrant usually. So this is the first image. You want to show him another image or two? That's the one I got it up. I see free fluid Ah, okay. So maybe we don't need another image. Yeah. So you're seeing <laughs> free fluid, super hepatic. Free All right. Fluid. Well, he's already some time out from his injury. So what? Uh, what's next? How are his vitals? His arrival blood pressure was 136 over 94, pulse was 65, but he is on metoprolol. Okay, uh, his temperature is 97, his respiratory is 19, and he's setting 98%. I don't know if that was on a nasal cannula or not. Yeah. 
Admit to the trauma unit observation. I have images, Billy. Okay, we have those images, as a matter of fact. So, a uh, CT scan of the chest, Ooh. abdomen, and pelvis was ordered. Confirming the fluid that uh, Dr. Ellingson identified from the back of the room. Yep, so um, I'm not going to show you the chest. There's nothing remarkable. Uh, well, there was, I think, some root fractures, but nothing Can you big. scroll down a little bit more? So you got fluid around the liver. Dr. Stevens, you ready to tell us what you think about this? If Dr. Clint can show us the rest of it, if we'll get it to come up. All right, now we're getting down. Uh, okay. All right, let's stop there. What do you think? I see free fluid on the pelvis and throughout the abdomen. Okay. I don't see any obvious uh, solid organ injury. Okay. What do you think about the bowel? Can you scroll up again? Pardon me? I, I just asked him if you could scroll up again. I didn't see any, there's no obvious free air. Yep. <coughs> so what, right, what should we do? Right around there, it looks like some fluid. Between. What should we do? Dr. Leroy is anxious to get him out of the emergency room. He's tying up sure. a bed. We'll, we'll oblige. So where are you going to take him? To the upper. Third floor? Yes. Okay. Who uh, who scrubbed with Dr. Endorf? He's on vacation. Vacation? <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> <It's very bad. laughs> I don't know. Dr. Endorf, would you mind telling us what you, what you saw? Well, what we saw was a so-called bucket panel terror emulsion of the small bowel mesentery and the terminal ileum um, with active bleeding there. Um, Devascularization of that portion of the small bowel. Um, so we resected that area. It was within a couple centimeters of the ileocecal valve, so we don't like to put a, an estimosis that close to the ileocecal valve and have two potential narrowings in sequence. So we took the first portion of the cecum over the right colon anastomos death, we didn't see potentially something else at the time. She came back and us. So getting into that too. We are. Uh, we relived that at uh, M&M already this morning. So. Okay. <laughs> All right, Dr. Dolesky, you are called on post-operative day five that uh, this gentleman is in the uh, is on the trauma unit. He moved his bowels for the first time. Um, but was developing uh, hypo hypoxemia, and a blood gas was obtained with a PO2 in the 40s. Um, chest X-ray wasn't, uh, you know, wasn't very, uh, wasn't remarkable. So he was sent to the uh, to the ICU, and even more before they sent him to you, they ordered a uh, they ordered a CT scan, which I believe Dr. Hawthorne is going to show us. So this is the second CT scan. Post-op day five, or maybe <coughs> yep, night yeah. of post-op day five into post-op day six. Yes. Yeah. So. No, they uh, they did a chest too, didn't they, Clint? Yeah. They did, they a, did a chest looking for a PD, and that was negative. That was negative. Stop there. What do you think, Jody? Hypoxemic respiratory distress. Uh, I'll tell you because I was on that night. We intubated him as soon as he got to the ICU. But his CTPA study, a PE study, is negative. He's got this abdominal CT. You're the ICU resident, and I don't see Peter Bagenstos, but he and I. This is what Peter and I lived through, figuring this out when, when the cell <coughs> came down. Go 
Here, I'll change your windows for you. I mean, this might not be the ICU. This might be someone that, that I mean, he'd already moved his bowels. This might be someone that we discharged and he, and he bounced back to the ER and you got this scan. What do you think? Yes, that's, that's probably more free air than you should see on the fifth, uh, fifth post-operative day. Just stop again, Clint, if you would. What do you think about this? given what Dr. Endorf just told you. So we have a surgeon who wants to venture an opinion. What do you think, Wolf? He had uh, large pelvic fluid collections with a large amount of urine. Yeah. And, and this, is, this is probably an anastomotic breakdown. The teaching point, and uh, we're out of time, so I'll, I, you know, there's a lot of surgical decision making that follows this, um, which Dr. Endorf <coughs> and I could talk about at a, you know, at another time. But the key point is that when you when you see a patient who has a complication, in this case hypoxemia, after an abdominal operation, think about something in the abdomen that could cause it, and an inflammatory process in the abdomen can give you hypoxemia just like a, just like a PE can. In fact, uh, a colleague of Dr. Endorf's and mine, um, you know, back at Loyola when we were both there, um, spent a lot of time working on model, animal models of injury. And one of the things in my lab that we demonstrated is that you can, you can create significant lung dysfunction with an injury to the leg or a burn, um, which was our favorite model, um, or, you know, or some intra-abdominal calamity. So the key, I think, and you know, and Peter and I had this conversation. Is yes, we'll we'll do the PE study, but think about something in the abdomen first that uh, you know that could explain. It. I mean, this guy was up and around. He'd moved his he'd moved his bowels. You got to think about something something going on in his abdomen. So he went back to the operating room, and more of his bowel had died. And we can we can talk more about that. But I think the key thing is to recognize the possibility of a patient coming in relatively soon after an operative procedure, <coughs> look at the site or think about, you know, procedure specific complications, even if, you know, a PE in this case may also seem likely. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry if I missed you this. Did you say he had or did not have ARDS at the CT? He did not. So he totally normal? I, I won't say totally normal, but no, he did not have an ARDS picture at all. But you, but again, you know, and I'll, and I'll stop. I apologize. We're going over. Um, but it, with many forms of lung dysfunction, chest X-ray findings lag the, uh, you know, lag, you know, lag the clinical presentation. This, the, the CT. Of, we did a CT of his chest. Obviously, it, it really wasn't very. It wasn't remarkable at all compared to these findings. Okay, we're done. Let's see if there's any food left.